Cool. So hi, welcome. I'm David Huerta. Um, this is the talk that I'm doing. It's called Alice and Bob are slightly less confused. Uh, just to kind of go off of the kind of biography, like who is this? So I'm Digital Security Fellow at Freedom Press Foundation. I also organize scripted parties in New York City and Phoenix. Uh, a lot of the kind of experiences that I've had with like user frustrations and things come from the kind of the front lines of like showing people how to quote unquote use Signal Use Tor. Uh, and then before that, I come from kind of a weird mix of a developer and design background and working in an AI lab that did mostly data visualization for really complicated things. Uh, there's my Twitter. I, it's, it's mostly just me yelling at the F train nonstop. Uh, and then this is actually a sequel. So this is a talk, uh, like the continuation of a talk that I did in 2015. Uh, so let's talk about that. So 25, 24 months ago, actually 24 months ago, uh, I did a talk on kind of usability, privacy, and just like these are the issues that people ran into at crypto parties. And here's some suggestions on like what to do based on things like human interface guidelines, which are kind of the rules that different platforms have for like making things feel more like the platform that they were designed for, among other kind of design concepts. Uh, so these, I'm just going to like recap kind of like the very like the, the very kind of cliff notes gist of what that talk was about. Uh, the new Mac interface guidelines that are online leave out all the UX fundamentals, so they'll just be like, you know, put an arrow here instead of a hamburger menu or whatever. Uh, but if you find this like really old 1983 copy of the Macintosh human interface guidelines, it goes through kind of the baseline fundamentals of user experience, uh, which apply to like everything. This is kind of at the forefront of like people doing things with like graphical user interfaces. Before, of course, it was a command line at the beginning. Um, and this is like kind of the way to like deal with user interfaces that are based inside screens. Uh, and it, so just kind of the recap of what that basically talks about if you don't want to spend like four dollars at a used bookstore on it. Uh, so there's these concepts that we think about in UX uh, modelessness. So the idea of like having to depend on human memory to remember what state you can do certain things in versus others. Uh, this is a lot of uh, like a lot of Emacs people are like, this is why you don't like them uh, because you have to remember what state you're in, whether you're in write or whether you're like in a command entry mode. Uh, and the problem that is kind of specific to a lot of cryptography software, it's usually kind of like bolted on top of some other insecure protocol. This is especially the case of like PGP, for example, where it's like people generally, not generally, but like some people use it for email. So in this case, email is just not designed to be, by modern standards, a secure protocol. Uh, and you have to remember to like do things in a certain way to have it be in it and encrypted. But there's like an unsecure mode and a secure mode that gets like mentally modeled on top of that. And having to remember that is uh, is a problem. Uh, perceived stability. Uh, so this is like the idea of. Um, the UI kind of reflecting what's actually going on behind the scenes. Uh, mostly, a lot of the points that it was making in 1993 were mostly about like making sure that if something is working really well behind the background, that the front end reflects that, so that people don't automatically assume that like you know, oh no, there's an error. It, that because in the, especially in like security software, a lot of users' assumption won't be like you know, computers are garbage, code is garbage, nobody did tests on it, but mostly, oh no, something went wrong, I must have been hacked. So you really don't want to like cause anxiety. You don't want to freak users out. Another book that I recommend actually kind of speaking on anxiety and design is called, oh yeah, sorry. Another book that is not mentioned, uh, aside, thank you, from, aside from the fact that, aside from the original Mac Hig, is also, uh, I think, a list apart publishes something called the uh, Designing for Motion, which is another good book, which is really good, highly recommended. Mostly talks about web design, but kind of applies to a lot of other uh, applications as well. So we have uh, user testing, and that is basically exactly what it sounds like. In this case, like what you make will make sense to you because you built it. If you're a developer, for example, but you want to put it in front of people that are not like you, in a sense, to like see how they use it, to see whether the same assumptions that you have about how this works are the same assumptions that they have. Uh, and that is why user testing is super important. This is actually pretty well established as far as like the methodologies for this. Uh, Katie Smith did a talk, I think, two hopes ago about user testing that I recommend checking out. Uh, metaphors, it's also just like as far as like describing what a thing does, like having a analog kind of equivalent of that to compare it to is a good way for people to understand what it is. Uh, so you know, you have like your notepad, for example. This is like you write down notes in or text or whatever. And uh, 
that is a common like thing that gets used a lot. I'm just going to move this mic around. So there's uh, user testing metaphors. Uh, the problem is that like in cryptography, like it, public key cryptography is weird and it's hard to describe. Um, and you know, back in the day, we had keys and crypto keys, and a public key is like cryptography key, but it really works more like a lock with private key as a key. So it's one of those things where we have to think about like metaphors that make sense to really describe the function of what different things within a system do. Uh, and then there's key lesson from 2015. So this is also from my own talk of just like things that were not covered in 1993, but like the idea of uh, undoing, for example, uh, we usually want to have like in software development a way to do that really easily. But in cryptography, like if, as far as like privacy enhancing technology goes, like for example, if you're in the old version of Mailbelope, you start typing a message, you go and encrypt it, but too late, it's already saved this draft in your Google draft. So uh, it's one of those things that like it's harder to pull off and more of a challenge, more of a design challenge than it would be in other apps. Uh, there's also the idea of just like you have too many tools and too many things and moving parts that a user has to manually deal with. So in like crypto parties, for example, you will have to go through like, oh, well, if you want to like, say you want to do the standard kind of cross-platform setup of Thunderbird, Enigma, uh, GPG tools, or GPG for win. Like you're installing three different things, you're doing, you're downloading three different things, you're doing checksums on three different things, looking for checksums, researching what, how you actually use checksums because literally no place that offers a download for these things actually mentions how to use them. Uh, and then going from there as far as like, making sure that everything's installed correctly and knowing what order to install things in. Uh, there's also just kind of a, I don't there's probably a better name for this, uh, actu like more experienced designers have for this, with the idea of false hope, where it's like, I'm going to do a thing, I'm going to do a thing. Oh, by the way, I can't do a thing. Like at the very last step of this long process that I've just gone through, it realized that this is actually impossible. Uh, this is a problem with like the YubiKey support in like OpenPGP, for example, where like the way it reads the card, like if you start typing a track. Okay, cool. I am going to have it right in front of my face. Does, does that work for everybody? I could, it's noticeably better, I can tell. Thank you. Cool. And honestly, like up until this point, this was basically my talk from 2015, so you didn't miss out on anything new yet. All right. So, uh, yeah, let users know. So GPT tools is kind of notorious for this. There's like a specific thing where like, oh, I'll start writing a thing in Thunderbird, but then I plug in my YubiKey, and then it's like, oh, I don't recognize it. You haven't entered your pen, but it doesn't prompt for it because it only looks for that at the point before the mail client is opened when the like GPT daemon in the background runs it. And like, it's like, oh, okay, here it is. So you literally have to like put your laptop to sleep and then in Mac OS 10, it'll basically re-kick in the GPG background process and be like, okay, now you can prompt, get prompted for your key. Uh, so that's what the like, deal of concept for false hope. And the other thing is also just like the internet is full of like garbage documentation. So like even if you like describe everything absolutely perfectly to your users or your audience or whoever it be, somebody on the internet will explain it really poorly, confuse them and cause more of a problem. So you have to anticipate like what other people are using to describe things in order to explain why they're, they're either wrong or why that might be confusing to explain it that way. All right, so we kind of in 2015 talked about a few different examples, uh, privacy enhancing technology and like some of the problems and then kind of some of the progress some of them have made. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're not going to talk about Pigeon though. It's Pigeon's a little busy surfing right now and uh, there hasn't been much progress on that front. Neither has there really been on Thunderbird since it's still kind of EOL and they're not doing anything but bug fixes at this point. Uh, so we'll just like skip right over those. So going back into what I mentioned about modality of like thinking about like an insecure versus a secure mode and what that means, uh, I kind of cited Chrome as a good example of this where it was like, well, here's incognito, here's like within this window, within this frame, which is like differentiated from the way the other like insecure modes work. This is the way like, it gives you just like the briefest amount of information, but it's not in your way. So you're not like clicking X buttons or OK buttons to like make something stop. It's there if you need it. And then it's not in the way if you don't. Uh, different browsers, like they've improved, they've like made it even more obvious that like this is different than the other windows, uh, which is cool. And it's like one of those things where I think the Chrome team has been doing a lot of user testing around that to see like how people make, avoid mistakes of like accidentally um, doing embarrassing searches on their non-secure incognito modes. Uh, other browsers of course have this. Um, the, there's a bit of a problem though that was kind of discovered recently due to user testing. Uh, 
which was basically discovered from this from a DuckDuckGo study, is that a lot of people don't actually know what private mode does. So like people can tell when they're in private mode or not, but as far as like the mental models people have, the assumptions that people make around these things, they're not super well described, although, you know, there is a blurb of text explaining what it is, but it turns out that like paragraphs of texts that are kind of in the background maybe aren't necessarily the best way to warn people about stuff or like really explain easily and quickly concepts like that. Uh, but they're working on it and I think this is actually like, this seems like the tiniest, most insignificant change. Um, but just looking at what it does to like say like yes and no as far as like does this protect from my ISP, does this protect from like other people using my computer, like kind of having a more like threat model immediate like real world application of just not being like, talking about cookies specifically but just like, you know, your little brother can see what you're looking for or like uh, your government can see what you're looking for, et cetera. I think this could be applied in a few other places um, and I would love to see that kind of proliferate in more places where you have kind of an insecure and a differentiation between an insecure and secure mode. Cool. So last time we were here, this is, so this is a signal, this is literally copy and paste screenshot from 2015. Uh, there was this idea that I had of just like, well, th this is kind of just kind of where things got thrown into as far as the settings page goes. And like, we're all guilty of this as developers. It's just like, well, we got to have some stuff. It's like, I don't know, let's just throw in the setting page, whatever, like leave it alone. Uh, it's improved since then actually a lot. So the, the issue with this, for example, two things. One, I hate the word fingerprint because anytime I've talked to people that are just new at computers, they immediately think of a fingerprint reader, which are actually fairly common in a lot of laptops and smartphones now. And they think it's related to that because they share the same namespace um, in memory and context. And it also doesn't say what to do with it. This is a problem that I have with, with the way people offer checksums. It's like there's no instructions on what to do with this like weird number that you're seeing. Uh, and that was the kind of case of what it was back then. Uh, the protocols changed so actually the way people would even compare fingerprints is different. Uh, the screen security, there's no explanation what it is. So that was kind of the main issue back then. Now you have exactly what kind of Apple recommends for like explaining things in general. So you have like a short thing. It's like this is when you're switching apps and that's the official name of what it's called in other Apple apps. So they're, they know what app switcher means is kind of there. There's um, other explanations for new features that didn't quite exist back then. Uh, you also have block functionality which is really important. I think unfortunately there's a lot of focus that we tend to have in information security on like the most, you know, making sure that we do things on the crypto side and on the math side really well, but maybe not thinking about a lot of the other attack vectors or like issues of what attack means in this case. Like what if it actually means that like your creepy ex will not stop sending you like, you know, uh, creepy texts for example. So this kind of takes care of that. It took a while for that to roll out. Apparently there's been some iOS issues that have made that a little bit harder than it sounds. But, um, but this is one of those things that I think you really want to have implemented as far as, and this is why people do user testing because this is a concern that, bring, that gets brought up in addition to like, I really don't want to share my phone number. Like it's another thing, but like that's kind of baked into the way this works. So that's, there's no changing that unfortunately. Uh, kind of similar thing. So this is like kind of what you do with fingerprints now where it has an entire kind of screen that's dedicated to like a process of what you do. So like here it shows you the state of where it is, which before you had to remember, you had to like, wor you had to like basically throw this into human memory to be, did I already verify this person? Did I not? In the early days of Signal there weren't that many users, so it wasn't really seen as a problem probably. But as we have more and more people on Signal, that's like more spaces in your like meaty like neural network to like save, um, basically to say like I already verified person. I didn't verify this person. Did I verify this person? Maybe I did before I got got my new phone. So there's all these things that have to be thought about uh, modes as far as like you know now you can do this one feature and this is what that screen is for. Uh, and it also says why. So it kind of gives you an idea of what that is. Uh, it has a few different options. So you have the easy option, but you can actually see the full fingerprint by yourself. So you can have some other means outside of the way it was designed for to compare by other out of band uh, verification processes. Uh, and there's a learn more thing, which I'm really a fan of. So people that want to learn more can learn more. Uh, outside of that, though, there's been some new issues. Uh, we have. Um, Kind of going back to the assumptions people make of like how things work. Uh, does anybody remember Path? The like kind of the, the weird like people threw a shit ton of money at it. They were like, it's the next Facebook. 
Uh, basically, the idea behind that was there was a big controversy about it essentially like uploading all your contacts and then like keeping them on their servers. So when people hear about you know, something on their side is able to see that I'm friends with some, somebody on their side, the mental model people have and assume is that like stuff is on the server because that's the way it works for their email, that's the way it works for social media, that's the way it works for like a lot of other things. And they're not going to necessarily understand like, well, we did a hash on a thing and then we did another thing and that's how the server doesn't know what's going on. Uh, and this is hard to explain because it's a very, you know, there's a lot of unique security processes. But I think having, uh, so this is Threema, they kind of do that as far as like explanations go of like what's going on. This is why we can see who else is on Threema while still like not giving away or keeping your like phone number or contact or email address or whatever identifier they use. Uh, and you get to the screen via, uh, this is like an ID. via these like little more information icons, which are c pretty common in a lot of mobile apps, so I, it's, I'm a fan of them. Uh, because some people, like for, for them it might not matter very much, but for anybody that really wants to know what's going on behind the scenes, I think that they should. Uh, and this is like an easy way to present that without having, you know, throwing the same thing at absolutely everybody. It's a good way to distinguish that. Uh, cool. Uh, last time we also kind of covered Perio. It's changed pretty radically since then. Uh, the problems with the last time were that it felt a lot like email and because of that people had certain assumptions on like being able to send a message to a contact without adding them first. Whereas now, it, because the design is so central, it's basically like Slack or like any other like 800 chat apps that are out there now. Um, people assume that you have to be added to a room or that you have to add people so that like mental model that people have about the way it works kind of is more in line with what people are already used to, uh, which is great. Uh, oh, something really great about this. The other thing that I mentioned last time is like, Perio would be one of those things where like, it's, it would be tricky to user test for because of the fact that you're dealing with the enforcement of a really long passphrase that's dedicated normally to human memory. And when user testing is done, normally these are like really short sessions, but in this case, like if you want to test like the strength of forcing somebody to do this long password and whether they will actually remember it, that has to be done a little bit differently where you have to like test over time, over a series of weeks, over a series of months to make sure that they still can. Um, in personal experience at Crypto Party is at digital security trainings, like people did forget these a lot because it is a long list of weird words uh, and there was a pin that people could use to log in so they would never have to remember it but then if they changed computers or did something else and they would like, oh no, I have to remember my long passphrase again. And they don't. It's a common misconception that like if you use words, they'll be memorable. That's not always the case. So what they did was they actually like kind of saw the same behaviors in their own user testing eventually. And they created a new word list. So rather than using kind of the common word lists that are out there for different languages, the way they created a word list that was actually memorable was they would look at like the way more people have like written language thrown at them. So going into the fact that like a lot of humanity isn't like super into uh, reading or at least like hardcore like heavy book reading like what is what do a lot of people watch is movies so what if we just took the subtitles for movies and created word lists out of that for each language so that's basically what they did so we end up with like very common words that people recognize and know uh, and you know maybe has less you know there's a bigger set of words so it's like fewer amount of combinations, but even doing things like requiring an extra word of more common words can help mitigate that. So there's like kind of weird different ways of approaching things uh, that has an effect on stuff. So uh, the other thing uh, that is something to test about that is a little bit different than other testing situations is testing for worst case scenarios. So in this case, have any, are any of you from the North, Northeast Corridor, the, the like Excella part of the country, like Boston, New York, Washington? Okay, you know my feels then. Uh, have any of you used the like garbage Amtrak Wi-Fi? Okay, yeah, yeah okay, yes, somebody, somebody will get this. The, uh, so Amtrak, uh, you know, it's, it's what we use to get around the East Coast, but there's free Wi-Fi. It's, uh, it's very slow and intermittent, and it drops a lot. So there's a lot, there's a very like, kind of situation that I think, and this is a known issue where you'll see people tweeting about it constantly. It's like, what does the Amtrak Wi-Fi suck? Uh, 
and you have to like keep that in mind when you're testing things that depend on the internet, for example, or even uh, whether th certain aspects of a network are blocked, like Tor. Uh, so this is Onion Shared. This is an older version, um, and this is uh, an example, real world from the real world of like me sharing something with somebody on a broadband internet connection somewhere else in the world. Uh, but I'm running as a server, so I am running this like you know desktop app. And when I first did this, like the Wi-Fi was fine, the internet was fine, I was like ping things, I had an IP address, it was all good. But then of course the Wi-Fi dropped halfway between like Maryland and Delaware. And it doesn't reflect that. It, does, it basically just has the same like green, like everything's fine, it's working. Um, and of course it's not, and so there's just like back and forth outside of that band of like what's going on. There's a lot of confusion, and that's the kind of thing you want to avoid. Um, some apps do this better than others. Some will have like an offline messaging thing that will be like, you seem to be offline. So there's like a process behind the scenes that will just check to see whether it can connect to the internet, usually by pinging whatever API server it's connecting to behind the scenes. In this case, there's no API server, but there's like other things that you can check to see, like do I have internet? Uh, the other thing in this case, which is unique to Onion Share, is like do I have Tor? Because there's some networks that block Tor. And being able to know that the reason why this doesn't work is because Tor is blocked is something that you want to let users know so they're not guessing. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Different ways to do this, Slack does as well. Uh, but yeah, th and this is what kind of the, the other side looks like and then this is what life on the, ex on the uh, Northeast region looks like. And uh, yeah, oh, that's the image I was trying to share. This is very important. I was very sad I wasn't able to share this. But there are a lot of improvements being done. So just like as, as I'm critiquing these things, like know behind the scenes that they all are improving basically. Uh, this is the kind of design issue on that. Uh, which brings me to another point of um, how I've been able to kind of approach design issues with different projects. A lot of commercial projects will have kind of a full set of, well not a lot, some will have a full set of teams made up of like a product designer, uh, you know, a product manager, a QA team, uh, other folks, a security person. Like with a lot of this stuff, it's kind of open source software. It's very scrappy. It starts off with a really small team and you know, they're not hiring anybody. So there's no dedicated designer. So like how do people get better at these things? Um, and some people have like strive to just like make design a focus of theirs. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about one example of that. So in this case, uh, Tails, which is the uh, incognito live, like that, Live Linux system that has Tor baked into it. It's something that we worked on a workshop on, uh, workshop on at Freeman Press Foundation last year uh, with a bunch of folks that were not from the tech world at all. They, they were here for uh, the Laura Poitras exhibition at um, Astronoids at the Whitney Museum. So basically there were, there were a few issues that we ran into. Um, I wrote them down and I basically just submitted it to bug trackers if it were like, you know, a software bug, a code bug basically. Uh, there's some things that are, that are kind of would work, that are kind of important things to think about when developing other software. So when you're creating documentation, um, th people like might not necessarily see right away that it's um, not inside the window or of the window or necessarily see that like, oh, the window dressing on this screenshot is different than the one on my desktop. These things are not always caught right away. So we did something where like, we noticed that in the instructions to use the live USB writer for Windows, for example, people were like clicking on the web page screenshot of what it was because it was the exact kind of size dimensions of what the actual thing would be. So don't do that. Basically make it smaller. That was an easy fix. Um, naming things counts because I, people have different meanings for different words. So every Linux distribution has kind of a default mode and fell safe mode. Uh, so for all of us coming from the Linux world, which is, you saw my Linux desktop, it made sense to me. Everybody else did not know what exactly that, that meant. So people saw this because they were using it as a means of like safety as far as privacy and what they associated with that. They assumed that that was the default mode. That there was an insecure mode, like there was in PGP with like unencrypted email and encrypted email. And they had to like go down one level to fail safe to get into like the secure Torified mode. So that's something that we changed by easily by renaming it. So, uh, so if you boot tails now, you just see the regular default mode and then you see a troubleshooting mode. So they know the reason why they would ever want to choose that option and like what action there is to do there. So it's very explicit and we deliberate on like what language to use based on what Microsoft and Apple were using for meaning the same things. 
because uh, we really want to like use language that is familiar in different situations in different contexts. So like people will use troubleshoot to talk about other tech troubleshooting problems. So that's basically where we ended up landing on that. The other thing too is just like making the documentation available offline. So back in, this was early 2016, um, there's a link to how documentation, which is what you go to if you want to like learn how something works. But what if the reason you're going to the documentation is because you're having trouble connecting to the internet? Uh, if your docs are online, you're not going to be able to read them. So in this case, you're booting a live system. So why not just have them offline and have them live in there? So that's what they did, and that worked. So people are able to like read up on what to do if they can't connect to the internet. What could be the problems? Maybe their Wi-Fi chip isn't working, but it's that way they can actually read the docs to see what the problem is. Uh, some things can't be fixed. So this is some Apple bullshit where if you have a live Linux USB drive, it'll just show up as Windows because it just assumes that operating systems are just like, there's Mac OS X and I guess Windows and that's it. So that's something that we can't fix the confusion for unfortunately, at least for, for Mac users. Uh, and so with Intel's you have the option of creating a persistent storage, like basically just like a looks partition. Uh, this is one of those things where like people don't necessarily know that they would have to reboot to be able to like start saving things there and have them stay in there and persist there. So just like having a note of that within the like, you know, the wizard that they set up for creating a persistent volume uh, is helpful, but I think it should go a little bit further. I think it actually should just have like immediate button to just reboot right away because that should be the next action so they don't commit that to human memory and depend on human memory to remember that they haven't rebooted yet to do that, uh, just to make it that much easier. So this is a new thing. Like, I, it's, there's not really a lot of people that I know that report design bugs. Um, there's not a lot of designers in open source in general, uh, which is a problem. And I think that's more of a, a kind of difference in like the kind of experiences that people have as design and what they associate with free or volunteer work uh, versus what we do as developers when we like work on open source. We're like, if we're working on open source, it's kind of just community, and we're just working on a project together. Whereas design, like the neural network of a designer and a developer will be f like basically trained on different data sets where you have like experiences of like voluntarily working with other people and then the designer kind of data set where it's like oh remember when you did that work for free it's because that asshole like ripped you off and like no lawyer would let you take him to small cut small claims court because it was like too small to be uh to be worth their time so People have different expectations on what that means so it's one of those things that like yeah it'd be great if more designers were like just start working on stuff on open source. But uh, for now, this is kind of the closest way I've like asked designers to participate because uh, it's worked out for me pretty well as far as with Tails, with Signal, with Perio. It's just basically just adding something to their bug tracker and being like, this is the current behavior. This is the, what we want the behavior to be. These are some design suggestions. This is the reference to like what I am like backing up this assumption with based on the human interface guidelines of the operating systems that you're targeting. Uh, here's some screenshots, and here's the user stories of people that were confused by it. Uh, and there's also the consideration of just like who's actually going to do that. Um, certain systems for doing that are easier than others. For example, for doing that on Onion, for OnionShare, for example, that's a GitHub ticket. That's super easy to use. Other platforms like the Tor Project have their own specific bug tracker, and they have you know, you of course want to search to see whether this has already been discussed, so you're not just like re making a duplicate issue. And if you have an archive of like, you know, six years worth of bugs and bug reports and discussions, that adds up over time that's really hard to like really grep, especially if like the search functionality of the bug tracker that you're using is a little bit more of a challenge or time consuming to use. So the bug tracker is something that is also factors into a particular kind of user experience that has to be taken in mind as well. Um, Cool. So yeah, and that's uh, it's Queen's Comfort. It's if you're ever in New York for Hope or whatever, like take the set, take the take the N train to Astoria. It's like if you like grease and butter and waffles, this is this is like heaven slash Valhalla of of that. It's pretty great. Cool. So that's the, kind of a quick wrap up talk. I wanted to like create as much time as I could for Q and A. Um, and you know any questions you'd have as far as what people see as far as like using all these tools that we use, or any ideas you have on like what makes sense for different 
uh, projects that you're working on. Uh, you have my ear on any design advice. So yeah, go, it's uh, microphones in the center, presumably turned on. So cool.